my friend Brett Freeman. What's going on, Tiger? How are you, buddy? Dude, it was so great to reconnect back in July after like I haven't seen you and didn't talk to you for years. What is it? It's probably five, five to seven years since we last chatted up in Portland, man. It's been a while. Yeah. So you were back then you were director of procurement at Interdent. Which yes, is like sir. Large West Coast DSO, 200 offices. You were evaluating procurement softwares and I flew to see you and then we went to see a couple of your offices and it was a lot of fun, but I was like 2018. Yeah. More importantly, you took me to Kachka and the, you know, that Russian joint in Portland and my yeah. wife and I fell in love, dude. We went every other week after that, man. It was, the, it was one of the best restaurants we've ever been in. It was great. Yeah. That's my highlight in Portland. Like every time I go there, I try to bring my friends and we try to go there. So yeah, it's, it's a good it. Every place. time we go to a new big city now, we're like, all right, let's see what kind of Russian joint. They don't have anything in Arkansas. So obviously every time we no. go to a new big city, we're like, man, let's see what kind of Russian joints we can find. Yeah. How, what happened to you after Interdent? Yeah. So after the Interdent, um, worked uh, a little while, uh, went down uh, back to Texas and worked with a, a 3PL company uh, that was getting into the dental space, managing distribution and fulfillment centers for dental manufacturers um, that were looking to go direct and or looking to kind of streamline some of their supply chain procurement efforts. Um, and then ultimately COVID hit and we all know, you know, the, the aftermath of that and ended up uh, starting Source Club st uh, shortly after that, uh, you know, really kind of consulting with those DSO partners out there. Um, so while we're on this, what's holding manufacturers, dental manufacturers to go direct? Um, the the predominantly their relationship with the distributors, right? So most of these manufacturers, um, their biggest clients and sales come from distributors. Um, and most of these manufacturers are contractually locked in that they can't sell direct to consumer. They can only sell through distribution. And so for a lot of these manufacturers to go direct would mean that the suppliers would likely not carry their products anymore. And so their sales would you know, theoretically dropped to zero overnight. Granted, some of those manufacturers could still win back some of their sales for those doctors that love their products and things of that nature. But ultimately, a lot of manufacturers are just scared to go direct and aggravate the distributors um, for, 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 uh, for, for that lack of sales, that drop of sales. And, and, and it's tough for manufacturers, right? Because at the end of the day, manufacturers' biggest customers are the distributors their biggest competitors are also the distributors because since they have their house brand products and things of that nature, you know, it's, it's a very tough place for manufacturers to go direct these days. Interesting. Cause I feel like a lot of doctors do have those questions, right? So you would have a, a, a doctor at the private practice who loved their car composite, mm -hmm. right? Like, or vocal composite. And it's like, you have one price locked in with the distributor, a, like a big destination distributor. And then they're like, well, we're going to switch up the distributor and the price is different. And so a lot of times it's like, I get these questions. Wait a minute. Why can't I just buy directly from a manufacturer? Like, like why can't I buy Vocal directly? I can get the rep to show up into my office. And frankly, like a lot of offices do love their product reps, like right? the manufacturer reps the manufacturer more than they rep. do supplier reps, right? So there are some good supplier reps, but far in between. And so... Well and, and the reality is, is there's, there's a lot of manufacturers that have different divisions that sell through distribution and direct. I mean, you look at Invista, Kerr goes through distribution, but Nobel, Implant Direct, uh, you know, some of those others are going, you know, Ormco are going direct to consumer. On Densply, you have the Densply piece that goes through distribution, and then you got the Densply Endo piece that goes direct. And so most of these manufacturers have a division that sells direct, typically on the specialty side of things. But they're just they're too worried about, you know, displacing that distributor and, and, and soiling that relationship with the distributor to go direct, even though those dental offices are asking to go direct. And and as you know, from your side, with the advancements in these procurement softwares, the ability to order from multiple different places or direct or multiple different suppliers is now becoming much easier. You know, historically, they had to go to one website and they could, you know, from you know a distributor, and they'd order everything they want. Well, you know, the idea is like, okay, now if we go to direct manufacturers, we have to go to different websites or email different reps. But with the advancements in procurement softwares, it's almost like they can order the same exact products and have that single sign on platform, you know, uh, uh, leverage or efficiency that they would have previously through that sole distributor. Right. I'm going to put you in the spot. Do it. And Let's ask do it. You, ask you to predict when do you think 3M will go direct? 
Oh man. Uh, shoot. I'd, I'd be lying to you if I had an answer, man, if I had it my way, it'd be Sorry. tomorrow. Right. But, uh, yeah, you know, we're all guessing. We're all yeah, guessing. You know, uh, man, I don't know. It's that's, that's kind of a, t- a tough conversation. Um, I think there will be some intermediary steps before they go direct. Um, such as maybe it's a direct division with DSOs, right? So DSOs represent this big volume and maybe it makes sense to start dabbling on that side. I don't think it will, with 3M or any manufacturer, Dense Fly, Kerr, whoever, I don't think it'll ever be a flip of a switch. I think it'll be a slow, natural transition. Maybe they focus first on the large national DSOs that buy a lot of volume from them, right? Ones where they can realize some higher profitability and the client can save some money. And then, you know, maybe they start working with some other distributors to start looking at some drop shipping, you know, th- you know, pieces where, you know, they order through the procurement software and that manufacturer drop ship it's dr- drop ships it directly to the consumer. But it all gets billed through a distributor. Right. So by definition, they're still selling through distribution, but you're cutting out the middleman having to actually receive store and pick pack and ship those products to the end user. So kind of cutting out that middleman margin. But you know, as for timelines, man, I, I think that we're going to see some very drastic changes in the next three to five years, but I think they're going to be gradual changes and never truly a flip of the switch. Do, do I think that, you know, a company like 3M or Dentsply or Kerr or GC Americal will ever go 100% direct and not sell through distribution? I don't think so. The distributor partners are too important and va- I don't want to say valuable. They're too important for that uh, and they carry too much weight for that. Um, but I think you'll start seeing manufacturers get a bit more creative on their, you know, uh, on the supply chain efficiency of trying to go direct and cut out some of those middleman distributor margins that are typically pretty high and fluctuate month over month. That makes sense. Cool. So then after that little stint in Texas, then you go into your own route and open up Source Club. So can you tell tell us more about what Source Club is? How did you start this and what pushed you to go in that direction? Yeah, absolutely. So I actually got my start in the dental uh, organization or dental industry here in Arkansas, working for an orthodontic DSO um, and really kind of uh, cut my teeth uh, within the growing DSO space, right? Doing de novo offices, open, uh, opening up multi-specialty practices, um, then left there to go to DHL, managing distribution fulfillment centers, um, uh, you know, for again, dental manufacturers. So I was able to take the experience from the DSO side and the distributor fulfillment side and kind of mesh that experience and knowledge to kind of create these in the end, holistic, efficient procurement protocols or operating models. Right. And so ultimately ended up uh, leaving DHL and, and going out to General Dental on the West Coast to consult with this B or not consult to work for this big DSO. And during my time there, I quickly realized the inefficiencies between those 30, 40, 50 office groups and those 200 office groups, right? And during my time at General Dental, I was actually getting approached with some of these, you know, some of these mid-market and growing DSOs to say, hey, can you help us implement a procurement strategy? And ultimately, I couldn't because I was working at Interdent at the time. But what I, what, I, what I found out at the end was is that there are a ton of mid-market DSOs out there, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 office groups, right? Um, that didn't have the time, the capacity, the knowledge, or even know-how to implement more of these robust procurement supply chain initiatives, right? Running robust RFPs, building formularies, consolidating formularies with doctor approval, um, you know, implementing uh, procurement softwares, running soft consolidations, negotiating with manufacturers. Um, You know, these groups were so focused on growth and top line revenue um, that, they really weren't paying a lot of attention to that cost mitigation side, right? And so when I started Source Club, we were specifically a consulting organization from the get-go, right? We weren't, we, our GPO division wasn't live. We were only were consulting with these small mid-market groups. Um, at the time when I started the company, it was just me. We're a bootstrap startup. Uh, we signed on six consulting clients pretty quickly. Um, and to that extent, I wasn't really, I, I kind of reached my max capacity. I couldn't bring on new consulting clients. Um, You know, it's not like I could hire somebody like me or, you know, uh, another me that has spent 10, 12 years in the industry that knew supply chain, but also knows dental procurement. And so I had to take a step back as a business owner and think about how I was going to continue growing my business outside of this consulting division. Well, we were approached, you know, when we started the company, we were working primarily with 20, 30, 40 office groups. As time has progressed, now we mostly work with 60, 70, 80, 150, 200 office groups. 
we were actually approached by an association. Uh, this association was anywhere between 250, 275 offices, and they wanted to come work with us on the consulting side. And during the discovery call, we quickly realized that our consulting solutions would not work for them. Because this association, each of their members were individually owned, they operated individually, they wouldn't all buy into a formulary or all buy in from ordering from the same supplier, and so our consulting process that we do for these DSOs didn't make sense for this association. And so I have always kind of had the dream of creating a GPO in a buying group, but it's kind of that chicken or the egg scenario, right? To get good pricing, you got to have volume, but to get good volume, you got to have good pricing. And so how do you start a GPO with that one or the other? Well, this association, we realized that we need to kind of, we need to really create them a custom and, 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 and creative solution to be valuable for all of their members, not just a select few, and, and do it in a way that people had the ability to kind of pick and choose what they wanted to order, where they wanted to order it from. And so we use this, this baseline volume and foundation from this association to build our GPO here at Source Club. And, and since then, we've grown to, to, to over 500 members. Um, you know, really, our GPO has been truly live for about the last year. Um, the year that we signed on this association, we didn't even take it to market. We just wanted to prove out that we were as good as we said we could do. We could save them. We could streamline our onboarding process and set up their formularies and procurement softwares. And we can do all that and, and, and deliver the value that we said we were going to do. And so that first year was about proving our concept. And, and we went live to, to the market you know, the year after that. So again, been about been live now on our GPO side for about a year to maybe even you know, a year and two months. And yeah, grown, grown that to over 500 members. That's awesome, man. We're certainly not the biggest GPO out there, but we're definitely one of the fastest growing, if not the fastest growing. Right, right. That's amazing. Let's take a step back. What is a GPO? Yeah, absolutely. So probably should have started with that, right? It's, it's, it's funny to me. I, I read a study not too long ago um, that said, you know, GPOs are very prevalent in the medical space, right? Um, but yep. I read a study that came out in 80% of private practice doctors in the dental space didn't even know what a GPO was or that resource existed. And so a GPO is a, a group purchasing organization, right? The idea behind a GPO or even a buying group, and we can even talk about the differences of those, but the idea behind a buying group or a GPO is that they take the combined purchasing power of their member network to go out and leverage and negotiate better prices with suppliers and manufacturers. And so instead of a single office having very little purchasing power, they can now join a much larger group that has much larger purchasing power to go out and negotiate and execute these contracts on their behalf. Right. And how does the GPO make money? So that, you know, the, the, the standard GPO model is very different than Source Club's model. The standard GPO model is that GPOs typically make their revenue uh, via kickbacks, commissions, or admins from the suppliers or manufacturers. So you join a GPO and you buy a widget for $10 that GPO actually gets an admin fee or a marketing fee. It, it's a kickback or a commission, right? From that supply, they call them admin fees, but it's a commission from that supplier for the volume that they deliver to them. Um, and, and manufacturers will do the same or they'll do it on rebates and things of that nature. But traditionally, that's how GPOs make their money is from the suppliers and manufacturers. It's my belief, um, which is, may not be true, may not be accurate, it's just my belief. And it's probably, you know, it's my two cents. It's probably about worth just as much. That is a very convoluted model, if you will, because if you think about it from the real estate analogy, when I go hire a real estate agent to go buy a house with me, the worst job that real estate agent does at negotiating that price down for me, the more money they actually make. And so the same applies with these GPOs because they receive a commission or a kickback from those suppliers and manufacturers, they are not incentivized to maximize your savings. The example that I'll give is, is that you know, you'll have an office in, and I hate to throw names out there like this, but you have an office ordering Crosstex two by two gauze, right? And they're paying, I don't know, $40 for that widget. And they go join a GPO. That GPO is going to say, hey, we have that same Crosstex two by two gauze available for $35. Look, we saved you $5. Isn't that great? But the reality of it is, is Crosstex manufactures a ton of people's house brand two by two gauze. And so we go to a doctor and say, hey, you shouldn't be ordering Crosstex name brand. You need to be ordering a house brand that's the exact same quality, exact same product at $20 a widget. And so these other GPOs, because they make these commissions, they want to save you enough to get you onboarded, but they're not incentivized to maximize your savings in the process because they actually make less money the more money they save you. Interesting. Interesting point. The pushback on that that I heard is manufacturers, distributors have different budgets and line items. 
So, for example, if you negotiate a price, it would be, all right, we'll give you the lowest price we can possibly can. And the kickback to the GPO would be going out of the marketing budget. And, and their, their argument is, well, it's not the same, right? And only few people want to understand it. And if you try to push for a price, they'll say, uh, wait a minute, you want me to give you the lowest price and on top of it pay you a 2% or 3% kickback. Yep. Right. So like that, that's what I've heard. And again, I don't know how much is true, but here, here you and I are talking about some controversies about the GPOs, right? Let's, let's be very frank. That's that money paid to that GPO from that supplier is built into the price, whether you say it is or not, uh, whether they say it is, oh, it comes out of marketing fees. It's baked in the price. Let's call a spade. Everybody wants to get paid and everybody's got to cover their cost. Um, you know, and so, so, so to that point being said, you, you know, again, like he, in essence, all a GPO is, is a binder full of contracts they've gone out and negotiated, right? They're going to slap that, GPO is going to slap that binder in front of you and they're going to say, hey, here's our pricing we've negotiated, go order it how you want to. You know, here at Source Club, we don't take commissions or kickbacks or admin fees from any of our suppliers or manufacturers. And so we have that same binder full of contracts, but at better prices because we don't take commissions or kickbacks because those are always built into the pricing. The distributors are always going to ensure that they're covering that cost of that admin fee that they build into that price point. That makes sense. And, and if we, again, if we take a small step back, why do you think dental GPOs are not as successful as uh, medical? Because we all know medical is like filled with buying groups and GPOs, and that's probably the only way you buy it. But dental is, is opposite. Uh, so to that extent, there's, I think there's kind of two primary reasons. One primary reason is typically distributors don't like working with GPOs, right? They're worried about cannibalizing their existing cells. There was actually a big lawsuit with, uh, um, I think it was like the, the, the FTA or something like that, um, where a bunch of distributors actually got sued and had to pay a big settlement lawsuit because they all came together and said they weren't going to work with GPOs um, because they're like, hey, they're just cannibalizing our existing cells and they're not delivering much value. And so the suppliers in the dental space have not been keen to work with GPOs. And that's 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 honestly the biggest reason. Right. Whereas in the medical space, you have McKesson's and Premier's and Cardinal's and Med Surge of the world. And they all work with GPOs, right? Because they all value the volume that those GPOs bring through acute cares or hospitals or surgery centers, whatever it may be. And so, you know, what we have found is typically dental is about 10 years behind medical. Um, and to that extent, GPOs in the dental space are starting to kick off pretty heavily. Um, but it's, it's, it's been a delayed reaction because those suppliers are not keen to work with GPOs. And then on the flip side, the other piece is manufacturers aren't super keen on working with GPOs. Because as a GPO, most GPOs, because they take commissions and kickbacks, and because they don't want to change what products their offices order, they want to work with every single manufacturer out there. So when an office comes to them, regardless of what products they order, they can save them on those products. And so let's use an example of a GPO that works with Implant Direct, Nobel, Strawman, you know, Hyacin, Neodin, all those ones out there, right? And so an office joins that GPO and, oh, we use Nobel. Great. We've got all this great pricing through Nobel. And so what happens is, is GPOs are supposed to get discounts because they're delivering you additional volume or sales that you wouldn't otherwise have. And since these other GPOs are working with everybody and their brother, they're working with all the implant manufacturers. They're not actually ever delivering them any volume. They're just cannibalizing their existing cells. And so these manufacturers don't want to work with GPOs either. And so when we started Source Club, um, I wanted to be fundamentally different so that suppliers do want to work with us and manufacturers do want to work with us and our members actually save money in the process. And so, again, that's my two cents, probably worth just as much. But I think that's why dental has been a little slower to adopt the GPO market, uh, you know, uh, the GPO operational model is because people's lack of need and want to work with GPOs and the lack of, of, of value that those GPOs bring the suppliers and manufacturers. Yeah. And another part that's that's fascinating to me is like suppliers have this tactic of, well, it's just the five percent of your budget. Like, why do you care? Right. Well, and, and dentistry and historically has been very profitable, right? So we all know that you could very well run a practice with a fifty percent profit margin, right? Yep. It is possible, or at least it was possible before COVID. I don't know where the HR costs are. Let me well, just finish the thought very quick. But now suppliers have this model of like, why do you care? The DSOs go into the market and they're like, 
join our DSO. And, and the question is why? Well, we have this buying power. We negotiate all these contracts, right? And so to me, it's like a very interesting play where from one standpoint, don't worry, don't care. Like, just do your thing. You're 10%, great, right? And then you got the DSOs gobbling up the private practices saying, we're going to give you all these benefits. And by the way, one of them is going to be the pricing that we negotiated. Yep, absolutely. And so, you know, we... We've seen there be a couple of different methodologies uh, about driving that, right? So, so one one reason I think GPOs are starting to get a better better traction within the dental space, um, and then you know sourcing consultants like ourselves is kind of twofold. The first fold is on the DSO side; the other piece is on the private practice side. On the DSO side, the cost of capital has gotten very very expensive, right? You know, a couple of years ago when interest rates were super low, these DSOs were growing and buying and buying and they could buy an okay practice and interest rates were so low that it, it would still cash flow that or, or it would still service that debt, right? But as interest rates and the cost of capital have started, uh, started increasing, DSOs have like drastically slowed down their acquisitions. And, and more importantly, they're really having to think about, all right, when we go through recapitalization this time with the interest rates going up, we need to start focusing on cost mitigation. We've been focusing on top yeah. line revenue growth acquisitions. Yeah. That is not really the environment that we're in now. Now we need to focus on cost mitigation, right? And the reality within a dental P&L specifically for DSOs is there's only so many expense buckets that can be manipulated, right? You can't really negotiate your rent, can't really negotiate what you pay your staff and your employees, but labs and supplies are two larger expense buckets that can be manipulated, that can be uh, negotiated, that can be driven down. And so DSOs are now starting to work with strategic consultants like Source Club to drive that expenses down because, you know, you mentioned 5%. We see the average around 6%, but again, let's call it 5 to 6%. And if we're able to drive that spend down to 4%, like most of our consulting clients are getting down to 4% or 375 yep, you're talking about yep. saving 20% on that supply expense. You're talking about adding a point, two and a half points to your bottom line um, without on the exact same products your office currently use, right? And so that really helps going through a recapitalization event. Um, a lot of DSOs are getting to add that back into the recap, but more importantly, they're, they're, it's, it's a way for them to combat the overall l limitations they have towards growth at the moment. But then on the flip side, you have the private practice guys. They're kind of in a different environment. Um, inflation, my, obviously- my yeah, right. That that's us. That's on the GPS side. Yeah. That's who, that's who we talk to. And inflation is running crazy, right? I want to think uh, dental staff inflation is is hitting eighteen or nineteen percent. Um, the the merchandise cost is is up seventeen percent. The ADA actually came out with a study that said dentists should expect to make five point five percent less profit margins this year than they have historically because inflation has has exponentially grown um, in correlation with reimbursement rates and things of that nature. And so you have these private practice doctors who have been successful for many, many years and had these great margins like you talked about. But with that inflation cost going up, they're about to start losing money, even though they haven't changed anything. And so it's requiring these private practice doctors to really look at strategic ways to start fighting inflation. And again, there's only so many expenses that you can manipulate um, and negotiate. And so a lot of these private practices and smaller groups are now coming onto these GPOs to offset that 5% potential loss in profitability. Yeah. And then especially we're coming um, with the post COVID and I've seen offices drives me nuts. I've seen offices that are still paying $20 for a box of a hundred for gloves. It drives like, me insane. Come on. Right. So yesterday I went to an office, they're paying five ninety, and they were thrilled. I'm like, how about 4.75? Yeah. And, right. And they're what, like, it's the one of our suppliers. away. We we were uh, we were talking with a 17 office group and they were wanting to come on board with our GPO. And they honestly were like, Brad, it sounds too good to be true. So we ran a free savings analysis like we do for all of our members to kind of show them, you know, what they'd be able to save. And and we looked, they were buying a, a it was a house brand glove. It was a 200 pack and they were paying twenty one dollars for that 200 box of gloves. And we have it for five fifty through one of our suppliers. And when we showed them that they were like, there's no way you can buy that at, at five fifty. And so we actually showed them, hey, 550 is our best price, but we also have a 200 pack available at 625. We've got another one available at 650. And they quickly realized that, my God, I, I'm still paying COVID prices for gloves. Yeah. And I yeah. never thought to ask. I never thought to look at it. I thought my supplier was going to lower my prices when their prices went down. And that's not the reality of it. Yeah, no, no. And I think, uh, I mean, it's a great conversation, but I also want to bring you back to what you said earlier. 5.5% hit 
on their revenue, right? Or their like how much they're gonna make. Pro- yeah, profitability. Yeah, profitability, yeah. So- right? And I always advise my doctors don't look at the numbers from a monthly standpoint. Look at the annual, right? So if you take a practice doing a million dollar on average, five point five is fifty five thousand dollars a year. Like how about that, right? That's and big. so. Do you have the processes in place to help you save that money and mitigate that expense? And again, that comes down to the lab and, and supplies and a couple other things that you have within your office. It's just just having better controls and better better um, visibility of what you're spending on. Absolutely. And then to that point, realizing that there are better that. There are other solutions out there, right? I can't tell you how many private practice doctors that we talk with and I say, hey, who are you ordering from? Oh, we're ordering from supplier A, B, and C. And you ask them why and they go, oh, it's the only person I can order from in my area. And you're like, that's not true at all. But the supplier has sold them on that story. And so, and again, it goes back to that my other piece that I mentioned, 80% of private practice doctors don't know what resources out there like a GPO. And so 80% of the market, you know, one thing that we do here at Source Club, we have an 80, 90 percent close rate when doctors come to us and everybody always asks, you know, why, what, what's the biggest hurdle for you guys? And it's that we have to educate every new member because most of them don't even know what a GPO is. Yeah. Brett, how do you deal with this? Like this is probably has no value to our listeners, but it, 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 I'm, I'm really curious. You go into the practice, private practice with your GPO, you look at their expenses and you're like, oh my God, like we can literally save you two to three grand a month. Easy. Mm-hmm. Right. So then they sign up. Probably two part question. How do you get them to actually start using your pricing? Because mm-hmm. then what usually happens, let's just say it's a binder physical, which is probably virtual, but let's assume the Dr. Smith will be like, Brett, thank you so much. You saved me $3,000 a month. Hey, Susan, next time you buy, you go through this binder. Yep. Now let's look at Susan. I know all the Susans, right? She's busy. She's got to pick up the kids at 530. She's running out of supplies and she goes in the computer and she's like, all right, I'm just going to go on my distributor starting with a D or with an H or with a P or whatever the B's. And she's just going to go in and sign up and put her things and check out. And doctor doesn't even know. Right. Yep. So that's my first question. The second question, which is probably more beneficial to me personally, six months down the road, they're like, Brad, I had my rep coming from one of these companies and they said they're going to match the prices. So thank you so much for uh, the savings. Like you really opened up a door for me, but I don't think I need that anymore. Yeah. So to, to, to answer your first question about realizing the savings, right? So here's kind of our workflow model here at Source Club, right? So we have a member that's interested in, in, in working with us or coming on board. We have our discovery call. We explain to who, who we are, what a GPO is, what we do, X, Y, and Z. Um, and here at Source Club, we, we mentioned before that we don't take commissions or kickbacks from our suppliers or manufacturers. Well, how does Source Club make money, right? Well, our members opt into an annual subscription to be a part of us, right? And the idea behind that is, is that before that subscription piece, we're not taking those kickbacks admin fees, so we're delivering on that best price possible, okay? So, but because we're subscription-based, these, these, these potential members want to know what they can say prior to, to joining on. So here at Source Club, we run a free savings analysis for them. No obligation, no cost. We say, hey, send us your purchase history report from your current supplier. We'll go through that. And we'll show you exactly on the same items what we can save you, right? And then ultimately, you make the decision, Office, does that warrant the subscription cost? Does it save you enough? Is the ROI there, right? Um, Let's say the office says, yep, it makes sense. That's tons of savings. I love it. It's the exact same products. Let's move forward. So we then, we essentially take that that purchase history that they provided to us and that savings analysis, and we use that to build a formulary shopping list. So all of our members here at Source Club get complimentary access to a procurement software, right? And the idea being is that, you know, when our members come on board with us, they have access to our full catalog. That's over 200,000 products, right? If they search bibs on that catalog, they're going to get 300 search results, different manufacturers, colors, suppliers, whatever it may be. During our savings analysis, we have gone through and identified that best price bib or the best price lidocaine or best price bite tray, right? Um, And then ultimately, we take that and build a formulary shopping list for them inside of the procurement software. And so when that ordering assistant to get them to adopt, the first thing you have to explain to them is that, hey, 
you need to be utilizing this procurement software. Instead of going to multiple different websites and ordering different products from different people and or emailing different reps or calling in different reps to, to, to place these orders, you need to be utilizing this procurement software to order everything from one single sign-on platform. It's going to make your life easier. It's going to make it more efficient. We're going to create a shopping list for you. But then the office then shops within that formulary, right? And so the idea being is that offices should always shop around for the best price supplies, right? But they should not do that every single time that they order because they're stepping over dollars to pick up pennies. They should identify the best price products available. It should be static pricing, which most big distributors are dynamic pricing, meaning that pricing changes every month. They should be working with a GPO that gets static pricing. We shop it out for them. We find them that best price supplier and that pricing is locked in for six months. And so we build that formulary for them and they go and shop within that formulary to order the things that they need. In the event they need a product that's not on the formulary, well, then they can go into the catalog and order it through there. But the idea being is by creating a much easier and efficient ordering process through these procurement softwares, it makes it much easier for the offices to adopt the change management of ordering through a GPO as opposed to their traditional you know, supplier route. So does that answer your first question? Yeah, damn. Yep. Second question. Remind me of what that was again. People in six months saying, oh, I'm good. My, so, my rep came in and said that they were going to match the prices. So one thing that we actually preach to our members when they come on board is, is that Source Club is a leverage tool. Now, granted, our, our membership piece, uh, we're all about transparency here. Our membership is a year-long membership, but you have the ability at any time to go back to your previous supplier and order from them. What we tell people all the time is, is that Source Club A is going to save you this money that we've quoted you on this piece. But the idea being is if you're a big enough group, we don't see this very often for single private practices, but we see it for smaller groups, three, four, five, seven locations, that when their primary distributor, they see that volume drop, they call that group or they call that office to say, hey, why did that volume drop? And they say, hey, we've started, we found a better price supplier. Well, that supplier then comes in and tries to provide better pricing to win that volume back. So the good news from the customer's perspective is not only do they get these guaranteed savings with Source Club, but now Source Club is actually somewhat of a leverage tool to get even potentially better pricing from their existing supplier. What we have found at Source Club is, is that on our initial customer savings analysis, let's, we typically save them on 95 to 98% of their products. So let's say they're ordering 100 products. We're going to save them on 95 to 98% of those products. Six months down the road, that distributor is going to realize they've lost volume. And so they're going to try to drop their pants on some pricing to try to win that volume back. Ultimately, when we see that scenario arise, we see that maybe we're now better priced on 90 products instead of the 95. So ultimately, that distributor typically only wins back 5 to 7% of the products because most distributors are not able to get their margins as low as our independent suppliers because those independent suppliers don't have the massive operating overhead cost that these big distributors do. They don't have these million dollar boosts at these shows. They don't have you know distribution centers all over the country. They don't have reps in every city and every state. And so uh, these independent suppliers that we work with can typically get much more aggressive on their margins because they don't have that massive overhead operating structure. And so although the big distributors may come back with a little better pricing, it's still not going to likely match what we have. But if they can still save on those five products, we're going to tell them route it through. So when we run our savings analysis on those five to two products that we're not better priced on, we actually show the office, hey, you need to keep ordering these through your current supplier. I get we'd love for you to order it through us and our suppliers, but because we don't make commissions and kickbacks, we want you ordering that product through the best price supplier possible. And so, again, our members also utilize us as leverage to potentially get even better pricing from their distributors. What they typically find is, is that that distributor will give them better pricing after six months to win that business. But they look up six months from then and that pricing has gone back up because that distributor has won that business back. And the distributor's whole model is to give you rock bottom pricing to win your business. And then over the course and length of that agreement or, or that relationship, they slowly and incrementally increase your prices to start padding that profit margin. And so yeah. although, yeah, they yeah. give you great pricing again, in another yeah. six months, you're going to see that pricing start to rise again because they have the business and they want to make more margins on it. And ultimately, the customer reverts back to Source Club because our pricing is static and typically always in the long term beats the large distributors. Yeah. And they'll try to lock you in into the contract and yep. some other stuff with the contract. You get free shipping when a platform like ours offers free shipping on a lot of vendors without locking you into a contract. So it is interesting to watch. And then I think, again, back to my previous comment, I don't want to beat the dead horse, 
but it's like doctor stop watching or stop worrying about saving a dollar on a cotton rolls mm -hmm. right like st like let's focus on big things you know where where are the consultants where this where that and again there are some people that bring a ton of value to offices i'm not going to discredit uh discredit all the sales reps but in my opinion uh even in an office that i went to yesterday they have an incredible relationship with one of the top vendors uh but i said how much is worth for you like how much are you willing to pay for that relationship? You know, you maybe know, you're even better off just paying that guy on an hourly rate. Yeah. Well, and, and that's a question we get a lot because a lot of our, our members that come to us say, hey, we, we really like our rep. It's a good guy. We've had him, had him or her for five, six, seven years. They come into the practice. The staff loves them. You know, we're worried about them going away. And I say, okay, well, wh what value are they bringing to you outside of coming by the office and having good relationships and shaking your hands? And they're like, oh, they never have a direct answer for it. But, you know, our average private practice doctor, we're saving 45, 50 grand a year. Well, not that's for the larger groups. Let's that's on labs and supplies. But let's look at just supplies alone. We're talking 35, yep. 40 grand in supply savings. And we asked mm -hmm. them, is that relationship worth 40 grand? There yep. has been a couple scenarios where the groups have said, absolutely, it is. But 90 percent of the time they said, oh, God, no, nothing's worth that kind of money. Right. And then for some of these multi-group locations that, you know, three, four offices that were saving 150, you know, 175, 180 grand a year, all of a sudden they're like, yeah, that's not even remotely close to worth that relationship. Um, you know, so that's that's typically what we find. There's a lot of reps out there with a lot of the big suppliers that do provide immense value, right? We have had some customers that have said, hey, yeah, you can save me 40 grand, but I don't want to go for away from my rep. That shows that that rep is delivering that kind of value. But not all reps deliver that value, right? There's there's probably 1%, maybe 5% of those top vendors that those reps provide that level of service and value. For the most part, the money's more impactful. And for these small groups, what we tell people is, is oh, we're worried about losing our rep. And we tell people, okay, what are you using our, your rep for? Well, they hook us up with the manufacturers and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, so what you're telling me is you value your manufacturer reps more than you value your supplier reps. And most small groups, they tell you, we hardly ever see our supplier rep, but we see our cur rep. We see our dense fly rep. We see our 3M rep all the time. That's where the value is. Well, hey, cool. You're still going to have those manufacturer reps working through a GPO because you're still utilizing those same manufacturers. And so most groups quickly realize that, hey, the value is from the manufacturer rep, not the distributor. Exactly. Rep. But exactly. that's not always the case. Yeah, that's that's one of our biggest things or, or like that's my big vision for zen is to at some point have enough leverage to turn the tables around and have more focus on manufacturers like private practice focusing on their manufacturer reps they can schedule the the meeting anytime they can test new products and then the manufacturer reps can go into the platform and lock their pricing irrelevant of where are they buying from which dealer well, I, I use the analogy of Amex, right? In the sense that these manufacturers have tons of services that not all offices know were available, even more importantly, these small groups. And so, like, for example, I put everything on my Amex card. My wife and I love to travel. We want the points, right? Well, my, my wife was looking one day at all the values we get from Amex, and we missed out on like five grand worth of savings last year. Like they pay for your global entry and you get all this Uber Eats credit and Lyft credit and like, uh, you know, Amex has all these services. You get like gold status with Hilton or some of these others out there. And so the analogy is, is directly like, you know, representable or, 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 you know, comparable to those manufacturers. Yes, they can give you good pricing on products, but there's a lot of other services that, that they can provide. You know, let's say that you're a 10 office group and you're working with a Kerr on your composite and stuff like that. Well, you know, or, or, or a Brassler for burrs. Well, a lot of these manufacturers have additional value added resources that can help you grow your practice, right? Like a, a direct manufacturer that sells endo products. Maybe you only have 10, you, you have 10 doctors, only five of them do endo. Your other five are GP, they're new out of school. Well, this manufacturer may offer a doctor development course to teach these younger doctors how to do endo, yep. thus increasing yep. your revenue. The suppliers yep. don't do that. The manufacturers do. And these manufacturers have, a theoretical unlimited amount of resources to help your practice, lunch and learn, CEs, doctor development courses, right? Um, that they can, they, the manufacturers can add a lot more value than just providing you high quality products at great pricing. Yeah, and so totally we're seeing agree. a lot more of offices 
wanting to interact more directly with those manufacturers. We have offices asking if they can buy direct through those manufacturers. Yeah. The conversation yeah. of offices dealing with manufacturers has changed quite drastically over the last five years. Yeah, yeah, which is a good thing. Um, yeah, so absolutely. You have competitors, right? You have some GPOs that launched in the past, and there are some big names that are out there. And actually, what's funny, there's not a single GPO, in my opinion, that can claim that they – like have a huge market share. Yep. You know, I don't want to throw the numbers, but I mean, there's not a one that's huge in my opinion. So if, yeah. I would say there are a couple that say they're huge, but because they have, oh, I've got a thousand members or I got 1500 members. But what we have seen is, is because most of these GPOs are free, uh, most, well, I say most of them are free. About half of them are free. About half of them charge a membership, but all of them charge commissions and kickbacks, right? And so when they say they have 1,500 members, what we have found is, is that, yeah, you may have 1,500 members or 1,000 members, but you're What's getting 50% utilization out of them, right? Because <laughs> you gave it to them for free. And so they're ordering it from you where it makes sense. Whereas here at Source Club of our 500 members, we have 95% utilization because they pay a membership to be a part of us. So they want to get that resources out of us. And yeah. so- Although there may be some GPOs that are bigger out there, I would argue that their total annual volume spend is equivalent to everybody else's because they're not getting the utilization that we or some of these other smaller GPOs are getting because we drive, we, we offer a lot more customer service around building formularies, consolidating formularies. And so that, that would be my sense. Yes, there are some bigger, but in the volume, like the, the, the volume that you have to go and negotiate that buying power we're all pretty much equivalent when you start looking at the actual utilization and the, yeah. the annual volume spend. Yeah. So how would a private practice would go about picking the right GPO for them? Because I would so, assume, like, let me just add a small twist here. I would assume that you have certain relationships, right? So like, for example, like a doctor loves 3M composite, right? And it just dawned on me last month that, Nobody goes and evaluates a GPO based on their favorite brands. They just go and ask questions. They, mm -hmm. they pay for whatever, or if it's free, they sign up and they're like, oh, your 3M composite is as expensive as with my distributor. Well, duh, that GPO is not set up with 3M, yep. right? So like, that's one of the questions that I tell my, my office. Like when you choose the GPO to work with, ask them about their contracts. Who do they work with? Like, what is your preferred material that you like to use? And ask them if they have any special relationships or how would they put that on the table? So my question to you is, like, how would the private practice would go about choosing the, the GPO that's right for them? So there's a couple different qualifications that we tell people. And, 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 and offices should look internally to what they what resources are most impactful for them, right? So let's say, for example, they don't care about supplies. They love their rep, but they're worried about labs. Well, they should be asking, what labs do you work with? But the, the offices should be asking a couple of different questions. A, what is the cost associated with working with that group, right? Are they taking commissions and kickbacks? Am I also having to pay a, a, a membership fee to be a part of that? There's some GPOs that take a percentage of your revenue, right? Which is just asinine to me. Why a GPO would ever take a percentage of your revenue is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. That's he, he, neither here nor there. There's a lot of groups that may see value in that. But the idea be is understand how they get paid and are you comfortable with how they get paid, right? If they're taking commissions and kickbacks and they're not transparent with what that number is, you never know what they make, right? You don't know what they're receiving on the back end. So how do you know if the, if the, if the, the subscription piece is actually a better ROI? So understanding how that GPO makes their money. More importantly, understanding the negotiations and agreements and contracts that they have with their suppliers. So there's a lot of GPOs out there. Most all GPOs out there, with the exception of Source Club, work with one primary supplier, right? Uh, you have this GPO. They only work with this supplier. And so the idea behind that is, is that they're routing you through their best partner, not your best partner. But more importantly, because they work with this one supplier, that supplier manages pricing and pricing updates and they have no control, right? So to that extent, most GPOs don't have what we call locked in or static pricing. They have dynamic pricing. Essentially that big distributor or the big distributor will go to that GPO and say, hey, here's our pricing, but we have the right at any point to increase pricing or lower pricing depending upon you know, the market, depending upon our wholesale cost. But what you find is they never 
lower pricing. They always increase pricing. And so here at Source Club, we have what's ca called cost plus transparent pricing models with all our distributors, meaning that our distributors can only sell to us at a flat margin across all products, and they can only adjust their pricing twice a year, meaning that our pricing is static, right? So you need to ask the GPO, is it dynamic pricing or is it static pricing? Because if it's dynamic pricing, yeah, that price may be good today, but is it good next month? Is it good in six months or is it going to continue to increase? That GPO is incentivized to increase those prices because they make more in commission. Where here at Source Club, we don't take commissions or kickbacks. So we're incentivized to lock in static pricing that doesn't change for our members. So you need to be asking how they get paid. You need to be asking what their agreements are and what their pricing contracts are with their suppliers. And then more importantly, you need to be understanding, like you mentioned, what manufacturers do you work with through distribution? Do you get special market pricing with any of them? And then also what direct manufacturers do, do you work with as well? Um, you know, because there are some products that you can't buy through distribution. And let's say that you're an oral surgery office and 60% of your spend goes towards implants and you work exclusively with, with Nobel. Well, you probably need to find a GPO that has contract pricing with Nobel because that's going to represent the biggest savings lever. Whereas if you're a private practice GP office and you order 90% of your products through distribution, you should be looking at a GPO that has the best distributor pricing. And so it really boils down to what products you're ordering, what specialty order, what direct manufacturer you, are you ordering from? And then ultimately, how transparent is that GPO with their supplier contracts and how transparent is that GPO with how they get paid as well? So that's, again, my two cents. Yeah. Um, so two, the two questions that you recommended, uh, do you also, is it all about pricing? <laughs> Is it, yes all about, no. is it all about the value for the GPO to the dental practice in the prices that they negotiated? Or is there more to that? There's more variables. I would say that's probably the most impactful variable, right? They, they want to see savings. That's why they're calling this GPO. Um, but I, I, I've talked about this uh, uh, in my little you know, snip, snippets on LinkedIn, where I talk about there's a difference between being cheap and finding the best value product out there, right? And so the idea being is value is a mixture of quality and price. And so we preach to everybody all the time value, right? You, sh you shouldn't be going to the cheapest product. You should be going to that best value. And so pricing is one variable to the equation. But the other piece is the actual service that comes along with it and the resources that come along with it, right? So there'll be groups come to us and, and, and they say, hey, Brad, we use this name brand manufacturer impression material, right? Can you save us on that impression material? We say, yep, we have access to that same name brand and we're going to save you money on it. However, there are other manufacturers that we have access to that are going to be better priced. Would you like to explore that? And most offices go, absolutely. You know, when we ask them, hey, you're using this name brand impression material. Why are you using that? And they say, well, that's what I learned with in school or when I bought the practice, that's what they were using or that's what my doctor taught me to use or whatever. And ultimately, they don't know that there are other manufacturers or resources available that may be equivalent quality, but at a much better price point. And so we actually identify those areas to our members as well as, hey, you're using this really impre expensive impression material. Have you looked at the cost of potentially moving to a scanner, right? This, if you move to a scanner, this is what it's going to save you on your lab bills. It's going to vastly offset the cost of the scanner and the impression material. Or, okay, maybe it doesn't make sense to do that. But, hey, maybe you're using this really expensive burr. And it's a burr that you're not really clinically sensitive to, like a 557, and you just want a great value burr. We can help identify that those value products to our members, depending upon how flexible they are in that solution. Um, the other valuable piece is that procurement software, right? At the end of the day, um, you know, what I always tell people is Source Club or GPOs in, in essence are a cost savings mechanism, right? They're a cost savings tool. A procurement software is a cost management tool. One without the other is somewhat of a flawed concept, right? Um, and, 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 and to that extent being said, yes, pricing is a great value. Yes, the value we provide around alternatives and, and finding better value products, but also the ability to save them money on those exact same products or better products, but the ability to also save their staff time in the ordering process, making the order experience much more efficient. They don't have to shop around. They don't have to go to multiple different websites to order. They now have a single sign-on platform that they can track their spend against budget. They can load their budget. They can see where they're at against budget. They have real-time visibility. Whereas they're ordering from multiple different websites or emailing multiple different reps. How are they tracking against budget other than putting on an Excel sheet or writing it down on a piece of paper? So there's not really a cash flow management 
perspective to that ordering environment. And so we look at pricing, we look at alternative products, great value products, things that we can help the doctor save on that they may not be clinically sensitive to, or that they're flexible or open to other solutions, but then also making the ordering experience much easier and much more efficient for their offices as well. Because typically it's not the doctor ordering, it's the ordering staff, it's an ordering assistant, it's a back office assistant. And those individuals, the more time they spend ordering, the less time they're providing value to patients in the practice to overall increase revenue, increase patient experience. And so those are the big three variables we look at. Yes, price is the most important, but at the end of the day, it's not the only variable. If we saved them a ton of money, but the ordering cycle was much harder and much less efficient, it's probably not a great value, right? Which is why we partner with procurement softwares to offer that value add, because without it, Source Club actually becomes less valuable because we work with multiple different suppliers, multiple different manufacturers, and it becomes very cumbersome to order from all these different places if you don't have a single sign-on platform. You, you see that all day. Yeah. And I think the biggest compliment that we got was an office in Dumas, Texas, like way out west. Yep. And the doctor, it was a while back before COVID, uh, the doctor literally sent us a note. He said, because of Zen, they were able to bring an additional dental assistant. Right. So like that's back to your point of like, how much is that relationship with the supply rep is worth to you? Right. So you can pay the the person or you can actually save the money and bring an additional assistant. Right. And all you have to do, maybe change your habits a little bit, you know, get uncomfortable, sign up, learn, get the training and things like that. But then essentially, you know, if you're running a business, Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, people talk about, oh, well, you know, if I save them an hour a week on their ordering, that only represents a thousand dollars a year in savings that don't look at the intangible savings that can be driven through efficiencies. We say, look at the tangible impact they can make when they're in the practice, not spending all this time ordering and doing X, yeah. Y, and Z yeah. when they're focusing yeah. on patient care. Yeah. Brett, you would appreciate this. I think early on when we launched that, I think it was 2018. I literally ditched the idea of price comparing to lure people in and to sign up. So like my whole marketing team was like, Hey, we got to build this t- tool where they can put their 10 items, upload, drop it, copy, paste, whatever. And we tell them how much they can save. I'm like, I'm not doing it. I'm not. It's, it's, like, a, it's, it's you, a lot of work. It's tough. It, it was easy for us. We got all the prices in the world. we got the whole pricing yeah. engine, right? I just don't want to, customers that are fixated on a dollar here, a dollar there. Like you either buying into the concept of you're making your practice efficient, right? You're as a private doctor, you owe it to yourself and your team to get efficient, to build the organization, right? Not just like by the whims of the winds to build something, but it's like, these are the kind of people I want to work with. And then I ended up visiting all of my customers, right? Essentially, like I've been to 220 offices by now. And so we didn't do it. Well, and, 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 and so I would offer a differing opinion on that, not, ne- ne- not necessarily di- yeah. disagreeing. My yeah, thought yeah, concept is, is, is one without the other is a flawed concept. So saving a dollar here and there, well, pennies equal dollars, right? Dollars equal thousands. And so to that extent being said, should they be looking at the efficiency and the ease of ordering? Absolutely. But if they can save money in the process, it's a win-win. And so, you know, working with us and Source Club and saving a bunch of money without a procurement software, without that cost management tool is somewhat of a flawed concept. Or on the flip side of using a procurement software and not trying to drive savings and drive efficiencies, well, that's just one piece of the pie, you're missing out. And so a true end-to-end solution is focusing on efficiency, ease of use, but also driving savings in the process as well. And so, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a two-prong approach. You can certainly approach it from one prong and likely be better than you were before, but it boils down to, there's always more meat on the bone, right? At the end of the day, you know, you should be looking at approaching both prongs to ultimately create that end-to-end solution that's valuable on the cost saving side, but also valuable on the efficiency and ease of ordering side. So then to your point, I think when offices are evaluating the GPOs, they should ask the question of what's your procurement and what procurement platform you are tying into. Because now I've seen You know, you guys are tied into a a certain one or two platforms. You know, there are other buying groups that are tied into the buying, um, uh, the procurement platform. So that would be another question. And when you are evaluating a buying group, you're also evaluating a procurement platform. 
So you might as well just do the demo of the procurement platform as well while you're evaluating to see if that's going to work for uh, you. Absolutely. And so surprisingly enough, only about 50% of the GPOs out there work with the procurement software. Before a group joins on with a GPO, I would incentivize them only work with a GPO that provides you that procurement software resource or they have a procurement partner. Um, because at the end of the day, when they slap that binder full of contracts in front of you and it's great pricing, they go tell you to order it how you want to. They're only focusing on cost savings. They're not focusing, like we talked about, it's only a one prong approach. They're not focusing on the efficiency yeah. and ease of ordering. Now, yeah. you mentioned those GPOs that partner with procurement softwares. Well, like you mentioned, we work with all of them, most of the procurement softwares out there. Most of the GPOs only work with one procurement software. Yeah. The reality of it is, and, and, and granted, Tiger, you may wince when I tell you this, but what we have seen is that each procurement software does something fundamentally better than the others. But to that point being said, I don't know that there is a procurement software that does everything better than everybody, right? And so the idea behind it is, is that- not yet. Not yet. That's right. Exactly. Not yet. But the idea being is that one, if, if, you, if, if your GP only, only works with one procurement software, how do you know that that procurement software is the right procurement software for you, right? You, you don't know, if, if, until if you're, you try it. You don't. Exactly. And so with us here at Source Club, the reason we work with everybody and the reason we work with all the procurement softwares is because we want to work with our office and understand what variables are most important to them. And then we can suggest a procurement software after that, right? If their preference is inventory management, hey, that's as in supplies things, right? Nobody does inventory management like you guys. If it's a shop ability and they want to price compare everything, blah, 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 maybe it's this one. If they care about the AP module and linking and, and the three-way match process, maybe it's this one. If they, compare, if they care about control and having this concrete system that nobody can adjust, maybe it's this one. If it's, hey, we're that new age DSO model and we allow autonomy and we want to give everybody access to everything they want, well, maybe that's a different procurement software. And so by working with a GPO that only works with one procurement software, you may not be utilizing the procurement software that represents the best value for your organization. Yeah, yeah. Brett, I think you know what you should do. I, I hate saying this. I hate when people tell me what I should do, but I really think you need to do this. Like there's got to be a blog post or like a long content piece somewhere on your website where you evaluate all the procurement platforms based on certain criteria. Absolutely. Because now it's a lot of us, right? So like yep. there's nothing I can do, but there's like 25 procurement platforms. And a lot well, of people don't even know what the procurement is. They're like, it's a purchasing platform. And everybody has angles, everybody has strengths and weaknesses. And I feel like somebody like you independent, you're not tied to one. So I would tend to listen to you and yep. it, like take your advice versus some other buying group that's tied to one and they have a contract and they will try to evaluate other platforms. But imagine yep. a doctor, we talked about how to evaluate the buying group, right? But besides evaluating a buying group before they sign up, now they need to evaluate the procurement platform. Yep. And, and to that point being said, if, if a GPO works with one procurement platform, it's likely because they're getting a benefit from that procurement platform. Whereas again, on our side, we don't take any commissions or kickbacks. And so we're not pushing you towards our best partner. We're identifying your best partner. And those are two very different equations. Right, right. So maybe we can so collaborate or write that piece. It's, it's, it's funny how many times uh, a DSO, like consulting client will come to us and say, hey, we evaluated all these different procurement softwares. And I say, okay, what did you like the best? And they all go, right. they all look the same to me. They all did no. the same exact stuff. Mm -hmm. And I go, no. that's not the case. And they show me their list. And I say, hey, here's this, there's this, where this one's different. That one's different. And then they go, oh, I didn't even think to ask about that. I didn't, because they don't know procurement. Yeah. They, don't they don't live know. it every day. Exactly. They don't know. Yeah. And, 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 that's a, and that's a little more sophisticated DSO with a little bit more time on their hands. Imagine a private practice. Yeah, exa I mean, I, exactly. They would much rather, I would much rather my private practice try to match their production and collections, right? 100%. Like that, that, that's their goal and not worry about the perker, but that's a separate conversation, which brings me to the last question. Uh, right. And then we're gonna wrap it up. Do you see a world where private practices are now gaining more traction and growth than the DSOs? I, let's, let me pull back a little bit on that question because 
there's certain things that I'll be very transparent on that I'm not the product expert, right? Growing revenue within a practice is not my forte. I couldn't tell you how to grow revenue. I can tell you how to cut costs. And so let's change, I'm gonna, I'll kind of change your question up a little bit and let's kind of focus on like the procurement supply chain side of things, right? So is there an environment when a private practice is getting better pricing than a DSO? No, it's buying power. I've never seen a private practice get better pricing than a DSO unless that DSO has never negotiated pricing, which typically isn't the case. Now, the question then comes, boils down to, can a private practice ever get better pricing than a GPO? Again, typically, no. Um, now, you do see smaller groups. So the term DSO is is vastly changed over the last five, 10 years, right? Used to DSOs were 40, 50, 60, 100 office locations. Now, seven, eight, nine office groups are being considered DSOs. And so to that point being said, there's a way to look at pricing, right? So can a five office group get better pricing than a GPO? Well, if you look at net for net pricing at the end of the day, no. But can they get better manufacturer wholesale special market pricing than a GPO can? Absolutely. But their distributor margins are so big and so fat that they ultimately end up paying more for that product. So let's use an example. Here at Source Club, we don't get um, honors pricing from certain manufacturers, right? Because they don't want to work with GPOs because we cannibalize their existing sales. Again, manufacturers in the dental space don't see value in GPOs. So can most you, can GPOs, you explain what cannibalizing is? Just yeah, sorry so, to interrupt. So the idea being is if an office is ordering uh, through uh, outside of a GPO and they're ordering through 3M, right? Um, and they go to a GPO and that GPO has preferential pricing through 3M, 3M is not actually receiving any volume. They're actually having to sell that product now at a lower cost to that customer, meaning that they used to sell 10 grand worth of products to them a year. Well, now they join this GPO and nothing has changed, but now they only sell eight grand worth of products, right? Yeah. So these manufacturers don't like giving GPOs special market pricing because they ultimately just cannibalize their existing sales. And so a five, six, seven office DSO has the buying power that they can actually negotiate special market pricing, honors pricing, DSO level pricing from these manufacturers, right? So let's say they're paying $10 for a widget. They go negotiate with that manufacturer. Now it's $9 a widget. Well, those manufacturers or excuse me, those distributors still apply their margins. And those margins are so fat at 30, 40% that although they're getting that manufacturer discount, our pricing is actually way better because our distributor margins are so low. But more importantly, when we work with that DSO client or that small group client, we can still we can still have access to their our suppliers sell 3M and Densply and GC America as well. So by law, um, all manufacturers have to sell the suppliers at the same cost per that contract. And so if a group is working with a big supplier and they get special markets pricing through 3M and they come to me, they still get that special market pricing through 3M, but our distributor margins are so much lower that they actually save money. So can groups get better pricing than GPO? At the wholesale manufacturer level, yes. But at the end price that they pay after the distributor margin, no, never. Mm -hmm. So let me flip and that Well, let me say when I say no, never. Yeah, I we get We have it. to look at percentages, Ma majority right? Majority of the time. Yes, 98, 95% yeah. of the products, they're going to save yeah. one, but... 5% of the times those, you know, 2% of the times those distributors may have certain products, they have a sweet grandfathered price in for something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess my question, what I was trying to ask is, do you see, if we don't see the world where a private practice can win in this acceleration game of the DSOs taking over the market, then what is stopping them, right? So that's essentially what I'm trying to get to is and ask all my guests a question through the question of, can we imagine the world that the private practice rate is growing faster than the DSR rate? I, I believe that. And I think the current environment that we're in is only going to help facilitate that. The cost of capital rising so much that these large DSOs are having a difficult time growing, making acquisitions. Um, but on the private practice side, what, you know, as these DSOs have limited funds to go acquire practices, that means less GPs and less private practice doctors are selling to DSOs. And so, you know, I, I think you're going to see more and more private practices not looking to sell because they're not getting the valuations that they were five years ago, three years ago when interest rates were so low, their valuations were crazy high. Well, now that the interest rates have increased, you know, cost of capital has increased, you know, exponentially, 
those practices are not getting the valuations they were before. And now it's like, well, why would I sell my practice if I can make more and do more, own it myself, have my own autonomy? You still have those doctors that sell to DSOs that are wanting to retire or wanting less stress or less management X, Y, and Z. But for the most part, you're now seeing that these private practices aren't getting the valuations from DSOs like they used to. And more importantly, they're starting to learn through attrition and through some of, of these other groups leaving DSOs at that point, the DSOs are not always providing the value that they say they do in the process. And so to that point being said, you're seeing a lot more private practice groups trying to work with GPOs like Source Club to help them create that DSO marketplace and serviceability without having to sell and go towards a DSO. So we talk about supplies and labs specifically. We offer also offer resources around marketing, um, merchant services, right? Patient financing, um, things that typically DSOs offer as solutions. We now have a portfolio of that we offer to our private practice clinics so they can essentially get the resources of this DSO without having to go join a DSO with these low valuation rates that we're currently seeing. Right. So there's a world where we can potentially see that. I, I think over the next five years, you're going to see DSO acquisition slow down drastically. And you're going to see, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to say an uptick in private practice ownership. I think you're going to see better increased profitability from private practice ownerships um, because they now have resources that allow them to be more profitable through cost mitigation and revenue growth, as opposed to going and selling out to a DSO and seeing it grow on the DSO side. I think we're going to see, everybody says, oh, the DSO, it's a bubble, it's going to pop. I don't think it's going to pop. I think it'll be stagnant, right? At some point it kind of stagnates, but to that point, when it stagnates, something else has to grow. And I think when DSO stagnates, I think right now, three years ago, private practice was stagnated. DSOs was exponentially growing. I think with the increased cost of capital, I think you're going to see DSOs start to stagnate and you're going to see the private practices start to grow exponentially. But more importantly, I think you're going to see private practices start creating their own DSO environment instead of selling out okay, why don't I get go get five of my buddies in the area and we start our own DSO and start opening de novos or you know, acquiring other practices. Instead of selling out, they're going to start looking to create their own. That's amazing. All right. On this positive note, we're going to wrap it up. How do people reach out to you? How do they connect with you to schedule demo, get the price comparisons and stuff like that? What would be the best way? Absolutely. So the easiest way is to go to our website, sourceclub.io. There's a place where you can put your contact information, reach out to us for a savings analysis. We even have a cost estimator tool where you can plug in a couple of prices for products you order, and it'll show you where we can save you on those exact same products. Um, and you can reach out that way um, or feel free to email me, B Freeman, Brad Freeman, B Freeman at sourceclub.io. Um, hell, call me on my cell phone number, 479-567-2024. I'm, I'm always in this office. I'm always working. So shoot me a text, shoot me a call, shoot me an email, go to the website. There's no shortage of ways to get a hold of us and uh, happy, to, happy to run that free savings analysis and no obligation to show you, you know, what kind of opportunities and advantages there are and potentially show you areas of where you may be taking advantage of through your current relationships. I'll include your email in the show notes. Perfect. Love Sounds it, man. good, Brad. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to work with you and see what our partnership would look like in the next uh, 24, 12 to 24 months. I think it's going to be exciting. It's exciting, man. We're, we're, in a, we're in a fun market at a fun time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It'll be fun. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, everybody.